building community through amplifying the voices and vision of innovative educational leaders, practitioners, and learners from South Africa. Welcome to JGF Amplified, Jake's Travel Fellowship Podcast, where we engage teachers, experts, learners in the South African education system dealing with the most pressing issues of the day. And today, Andy Amvi Dodo, I have never come on this podcast alone. And we have a special guest with us, Martin Gustafford. But before we get to know Martin and what it is that we're going to do today, firstly, Martin, how's your day been so far? It's been good. Thank you, Matabo. Yeah. Yes. So before we get to the meat of the conversation uh, in, our co- in our podcast, in 2023, we introduced something special called the JGF Diginos, where we interact with an interesting fact within the education system. And our Did You Know goes as follows. Education is a great engine of personal development. It is through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, that the son of a mine worker can become the head of a mine, that the child of a a farm worker can become the president of a great nation. Words from our former president, Nelson Holishata Mandela. This is a quote from his autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, published in 1994. Your thoughts around education, Martin. In fact, would like to say, what can you fully attribute when it comes to your own personal success to your proximity to quality education? Ah, oh, good question. Um, well, I, you know, like like everyone, um, you know, what 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 I can do and can't do depends in part on the education mm. that I had and I was lucky I had a relatively good education even if it was in apartheid South Africa it was a historically white school there was a lot of nonsense happening there as well but in some ways it was a relatively solid education but at the same time like for everyone part of your education happens at home and in outside the school mm. and um well, over time, I've become an education economist, and they like to kind of quantify things. And roughly, they they say about fifty percent of what you can do when you're a, when you're an adult comes from your schooling and your formal education. The other half comes from other things like who your parents were, who you mixed with outside school, uh, and so on. I mean, did you sit? Were you were you having dinner every evening with lawyers, or were you having? dinner with less educated people and that influences your life as well and the challenge I think and the exciting challenge for us working in education is that we need to try and make the effect of that of the schooling part as powerful as possible because the other home background things you can't really change yes easily yeah but you try and make life better for people by pushing on the schooling effect and that that is then what 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 I think Mandela means when it says you know, peasants can become lawyers and, yeah. and so on. And also, we often undermine the networking impact of 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 the schooling system. People think networking begins perhaps when you are in the job space or when you are at university. But a lot of the referencing of your own understanding of the world does you know, show itself within basic education, right? And the kinds of people that you know from there, carrying them through uh, to all aspects of your life. Well, yeah, that is is an interesting fact um, and a known reality that our former president has uh, has shared. So, Namsanje, in the vein of reflecting Sona, this is part three, but we're taking it a notch higher. Hypothetically, we were speaking about the budget in part one, part two, part three. We were actually speaking about the budget as it is, uh, what it entails. And for the benefit of those who do not know, the budget speech, which is preceded by the uh, the State of the Nation Address, details the spending and the proposals about 
what government will be prioritizing in that specific year. That is the definition of the budget speech. So we're all following together and we are of the same mind of what it is that he's speaking about today. And to speak on this matter, we have an expert in the room. Yes, his name is Martin Gustafin. But Martin, where are you from and what are you about? Um, I'm originally a history teacher. And uh, I got into kind of the education administration space already in, uh, in, in the mid-90s. Uh, first, Gauteng Department of Education, and then the National Department. And I'm now also with, the, with Stellenbosch University. So kind of I migrated to, to becoming an education economist, partly because it, it seemed as if that was quite a useful discipline yeah. in the education planning space, which is a very difficult uh, space, lots of things and people pulling one in different directions. And yeah. I think uh, economics of education is one way of trying to bring things together. Yeah. And where are you from? Where am I from? Mm. I'm originally from Cape Town. I was okay. born and, and grew up in Cape Town, but uh, I've taught in Toyando and, um, and now I'm working in Gauteng. Now you're working in Gauteng. Thank you so much for joining us, Martin. So on the 22nd of February, Minister Enoch Godongwana presented the budget speech. And your first impressions of what was tabled, uh, do share with us. Well, in relation to education, mm. um, I it's more or less what I expected. And, and what were those expectations? Well, we 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 shouldn't expect too much from the uh, f in terms of details from the minister of uh, uh, finances speech. Yeah. Um, the whole budget space is quite complex. So what happens first is uh, that the minister, the minister of finance, tables the budget review. So the speech is in a way just the icing on top of something much bigger, mm. and that bigger thing is the budget review. And uh, that signals a lot of things. However, we, we only really get to know the details for the coming financial year, which is April until March next year, mm. uh, when the provinces publish their budgets. Uh, they, they, they're called EPREs, uh, yeah. es uh, Estimates of Provincial Revenue and Expenditure. Then we really see the details. But certainly, I mean, the, the budget review... Uh, that came with the uh, speech, mm. uh, Gorongwana speech, uh, two weeks ago. It does signal some very important things. Um, and to a large extent, there were things that we expected. That doesn't mean that we're not worried about them. I mean, we are sitting in quite difficult times yeah. right now. And the challenge is to understand, you know, what are the biggest difficulties? What can we do within that space? How can we try and present arguments for better budgets possibly in future years. That That's really what one has to do as, as an education planner. That's your responsibility. Yeah. Practitioners and people who are interested within the education space when making their predictions around the budget speech and the education line item to be specific, everyone has their own ideas of what um, the, the minister will come through and prioritize. Uh, but one thing that has come as a shock, I think, collectively within the education community is almost the deliberate divesting um, in education, right? Because uh, as we do note, considering the incoming inflation, there is going to be, what, a shrinkage um, within the education budget by 1.7%. So 22 billion was is 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 what's given to to the department itself. What are the implications of the said uh shrinkage that we would be looking at throughout 2023? Well, the uh, yes, I mean one can t perhaps talk about, you know, disinvestment and uh, but it th this is something that Education is not alone in experiencing right now. Okay. So we're seeing th this kind of pressure in housing and in infrastructure development, in grants, uh, health. All of these sectors are experiencing the effects of the the kind of the macroeconomic trend, 
which is towards kind of reining in spending in order to pay off this debt, etc. I mean, there are huge debates around, you know, whether this is now the right direction. But anyway, that's what the democratically elected government is doing mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. And you're right. I mean, we are seeing um, the in, 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 in the budget review, we see the basic education line declined by yeah, 1.7%. Mm-hmm. And uh, but we also see declines in other sectors, um, and we we need to understand this uh, in terms of you know what is personnel and what is not personnel. Obviously, personnel is very important in education. Mm. It's about eighty percent of uh, spending. Mm. So a lot of the cuts are about the purchasing power of our employees, of our teachers mainly. Yeah. And um, obviously teachers are not happy at all to lose purchasing power. Um, There's less they can buy if they don't, if their wages don't keep uh, in line with with inflation. And the budget certainly signals that it won't keep up with inflation. However, we do need to at the same time remember that, that Prior to 2019, teacher wages were going up. Their purchasing power was actually going up. Mm. So what we're seeing now is kind of certainly teachers and other public servants and and many in the private sector are seeing their purchasing power slide back to what it was some years ago. Mm. Um, Certainly managers in the public service have seen the slide back happen start much earlier than say for teachers and nurses and so on. So, you know, teachers are certainly squeezed, uh, but it's not as if teacher, teachers have never been in this space before, before mm. all right? Uh, they've been pulled back by th- about three or four years with what's happening currently. Um, so, but now we're talking about the, to be a little bit technical, the, these are the notches that teachers and other public servants are on. They are not moving up in yes. line with inflation. However, there's something else, and that is annual notch progression. Mm-hmm. You move from one notch to another, and that's very strong in education. So teachers will, at the very least, get that 1.5% every year as they move up the notches. So that does, in, in some ways, soften the blow. But you know, what, why are we concerned about this thing? I mean, obviously... We're concerned about teachers as people, mm. but we're also concerned about the, the entire kind of schooling uh, process yeah. and how does uh, this affect uh, what happens in the classroom and so on. Now, the, the budget uh, constraints that we're experiencing are not only felt in the classroom in terms of a teacher who is perhaps a little bit frustrated yeah. about their pay, but also the fact that classes are getting bigger and the learner educator ratios are getting worse. So there's this continual kind of balancing act one has to do in education. How many people do we employ? How much do we pay them? If we pay them more, we can employ fewer, vice versa. And both of those are getting worse at the same time. Uh, Class sizes are getting worse, um, not because we're employing fewer educators. Our educator numbers have remained about the same over the last 10 years. But what has changed is the number of children in the population. In terms of ratios. And now, I'm quite curious, uh, as many people are, from your expert, expert point of view, Martin, $22 billion is given to this department, right after the $23 billion to health, $30 billion to address the, the power outage situation that we are facing as a country right now. The administration around the the funding um, in and of itself, do you believe that the issue is that there's not enough money that's being uh, allocated to the Department of Education? Or is it, the, is, is, is it maladministration that is the issue? Or that there is no clear strategy that really encompasses the day-to-day usage of funds. So we know that majority of the budget goes towards teachers, um, towards salaries, yes? Uh, And then how do we 
use the same funding to create interventions around crises that show themselves every day. So is the issue that we are not getting enough money? Is the issue maladministration? Or is the issue that the budget doesn't reflect the crisis of the day which needs to be addressed? Or, okay, I mean, firstly, I, th- I need to clarify something, and that is, and, and a, a, a lot of people misunderstand where the education budget lies. Mm. So the $22 billion you are referring to is for the national department, mm. but the entire schooling system is just under 300 Well, with the national department, it comes to about $300 billion a year. Okay. So it's an enormous amount of money. And um, now, when Godogwana presents his documents, there are two important documents. One, one is the budget review, which looks at the entire country, provinces, and that's where you'll, you'll see the $300 billion that is going to go to provinces. Okay. Then there's something called the estimates of national expenditure, and that's how much money goes to each individual national department. All right. Now, the, na- this, the, the national department doesn't run schools. Mm. It's the provincial departments, and they are completely separate organizations who, and it it's often comes as a, as a surprise, they actually don't report to the national minister. They report to the provincial premier in our constitutional system. There are very, very close ties between the National Minister of Basic Education and the nine education departments, but technically they don't report to the National Minister, and that's part of what makes this whole system quite complicated. They report to the to their premier, to their provincial premier. So, but to get to your question, your very important question around, you know, is is there enough money? Um, is the money used well? Um, there are there is of course a lot of concern in in the country currently about where public money goes and we see this in the media all the time um the education sector i think is relatively clean it hasn't been a hundred percent clean but it's relatively clean partly because so much of the money goes to personnel you know it does and to teachers and there are unions and there are all sorts of kind of checks and balances, it's very difficult to create a lot of ghost teachers or to siphon money off away from teacher salaries. The unions would pick that up immediately. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is not like building dams or you know, sp- buying coal and things like that where, where perhaps things get a little bit more difficult and, and, and murky. So I would say that the problem is not so much kind of raw kind of maladministration in, in, in education. People do complain, are we getting value for money? We, Relative to our GDP, we spend a good amount of money on education. Mm. Um, the problem is not so much that money is kind of disappearing, but that uh, we, we should be getting better results given the 400,000 people we have in this enormous system. And uh, I mean, from an, given that I'm now an education economist, I mean, I, I I think it's really important to focus on two sides of this improvement process. And mm-hmm. one on the one side, there is of course support to teachers. So teachers have a difficult job to do, often with very large classes. They need support, and unions rightly demand support mm-hmm. from their district offices and so on. You know, give us the materials, give us the training, uh, give us the psychosocial re- support, whatever we need. That's all very important. But I think at the same time, one needs to remember, and this is what economists like to think about, is incentives. Not only financial incentives, but all the kind of incentives. What what help, What makes me as a teacher feel that it's worth, you know, putting in a lot of extra effort and, you know, loving my work and understanding my work. And here, we need to... Um, on the one hand, we need to make sure that we don't overburden teachers with unnecessary administration, things mm-hmm. like that. That disincentivizes teachers. And a lot of teachers, I think, rightly complain about that. And that is something that, that I think is on the agenda and it should be on the agenda. Um, then I think a point that I often make is that uh, whilst secondary schools have quite a lot of accountability in terms of the the, the service they must provide, you know, they must take young people up to matric and get them to have as good a matric as possible. That 
functions relatively well because there's such a lot of social pressure around the matric. And there are provinces where if you as a school principal don't produce the res expected results, there are quite serious negative consequences. You could be moved out of your post, etc. However, I think at the primary level, we have a bit of an accountability problem. So although we don't see the levels of kind of social violence and things that you see in some secondary schools, if we don't get education right at the primary school, secondary schools are going to suffer. And that means, how does one do accountability in, 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 in for learning mm. in primary schools? Now, I'm not suggesting we have a matric exam in grade seven or something like that, but certainly I think there are ways of getting a better sense of how well are children doing and making sure that schools that are not getting children to read, for instance, are held accountable for that. Mm. You know, a 10-year-old should be able to read at a basic minimum level. If that doesn't happen, that's a kind of betrayal of the system to the citizens, the parents, the children themselves. So practitioners in the space, um, they cry how the, the, the budget is being distributed, right? We have one hand having to have the daily maintenance of a whole uh, department, what you call the personnel, payment of people, this, that, and the third. But also it's the recognition that we are suffering the impact of COVID-19. So what happened in that two years took back the country as it relates to education by 10 years in particular uh, with maths and literacy. And now there aren't any policies and strategies specific to the crisis at hand um, in, 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 in various spaces, right? So uh, when I think of of equal education, she talks about how there is a systematic decline of infrastructure uh, within the education system. She speaks about that there is a direct uh, decline in investment in, 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 in materials being sent to schools, right? So how much of this budget should be dedicated to crisis management? And is this recognized, A, or B, is there leeway for crisis management with the budget that is already uh, being allocated nationally? I think there is. Uh, they, despite the, 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 the squeezing that we're experiencing, I think there is, there is space for us to do a lot more and to do things um, better. You, and, and absolutely, we, we have to think now in terms of this pandemic which we've just experienced, and it has created uh, problems we never imagined mm -hmm. before. Um, specifically, I think there are children who lost schooling when uh, the pandemic hit us are probably, unfortunately, they're probably going to feel the impacts of this for the next 40 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they, you know, they, there's research that shows where Communities have experienced, you know, earthquakes or floods and re natural disasters that have disrupted schooling. Forty years later, you can see the effects in the earnings and the, the out in people's futures. Mm. And I, certainly, we we can reduce those that harm. And I think we are. I mean, I I don't agree that there's nothing that we are doing. There's a, there's there's there, there's a huge uh, a catch up uh, program. Um, there's been a simplification of certain aspects of the curriculum. There's been a lot of work uh, directed at the recovery. And I think some of that is would have been good even without the pandemic. I think that the narrowing down of the curriculum to more kind of important things uh, was perhaps necessary anyway. And um, I would disagree that we've been set back 10 years. Um, I, I, I interact a lot with the, uh, equal education people. I have a huge respect for them. Uh, I think they do an amazing work in, in putting important things on the, on the table. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I wouldn't agree that we, we, we've slid back 10 years. Um, we have certainly slid back maybe four, five years. But what we need to remember is that Yes, whilst learners who had their schooling disrupted are going to feel these effects, mm. 
Just think of these young, younger children who are moving into grade one now, mm -hmm. this year. Sure, maybe the, their preschool was probably disrupted, mm -hmm. but in a way they're coming with a fresh start. And remember there's one thing that was not that was not destroyed by the pandemic, and that is the ability of teachers. So when we see, we have, in fact, over 20 years, we've seen um, the quality of schooling improve. Um, and this we know through international tests. We're still not where we're supposed to be, but it's been improving. And why has it been improving? It's been improving because teachers are at better at teaching and because there are there's better accountability. Now, that that capacity was not destroyed mm -hmm. by the by the pandemic. Certainly, very tragically, we lost about three thousand teachers, but on the whole, those abilities are still there. So when these grade one learners come in, there's no reason why teachers shouldn't be able to teach them as they did before the pandemic. So I think maybe you know the the some of the the doom and gloom is a little bit exaggerated. I think. <laughs> I mean the the stat around the ten year progress uh, due to two years is a stat actually that comes from um, Prof Nick Spall. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking specifically to maths and literacy, right? So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily equal education that spoke about that, but also speaking about the quality of teachers. I mean, when we look at the the, the teacher dividend mm -hmm. that we are going to, which we are approaching, um, and the digitization of the classroom and the loss of of a particular kind of teaching style. Um, as a result of the digitization of the classroom, so maybe a lot, a lot of people though um, would disagree with you in terms of the quality of of teachers. But mine really is to inquire whether there are teachers to begin with um, who are in the classroom, right? So when we look at higher education and we look at universities that have uh, PGCE and 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 in our fellowship, we deal with people who say, well. Because of the numbers, I couldn't get in. So you have a scholarship, but you may not be able to get into a particular university uh, because of the number of intakes that have been there. So mm -hmm. I think when you speak about the budget, is that something that is considered? The fact that we, we may have good teachers, but we don't have enough good teachers that are going to look at the teacher dividend head on? Um. Or, I mean, don't 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 get me wrong. I'm not saying that we have, you know, the greatest quality of teachers. Mm -hmm. um, what I am saying though is that the quality of teaching has improved. It has to have improved. Otherwise, we wouldn't have seen improvements since the early 2000s. Collectively across quintiles. Yes, yes. And and I mean, what what's interesting is is in a way you're surprised because a lot of people believe either that things are, have got worse over the last 10 years. Yeah, due to the or, digital divide, yeah. Or or that they just haven't improved. But I mean, that that is not true if you look at the international tests up to the beginning of the pandemic, right? They, and th those are very, very reliable results. And I would say far more reliable than looking at the metric results. Mm -hmm. uh, far more reliable. So there is evidence that we have uh, improved, but we're still... We should be somewhere near Malaysia, and we are still not there yet. Uh, when you say near Malaysia, what do you mean? Well, I mean, okay, these international tests um, take a sample of schools in each country. It has to be a random sample. Okay. And then they go into these schools, they make them sit for an hour or hour and a half test, um, it may be in writing, it may be in, 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 in arithmetic, mathematics, and the exact same tests in different languages are applied around the world and are then repeated. Um, and this is what then allows us to see uh, what's happening to the quality of education. And the reason why we pay so much attention to this is because the economic evidence is quite clear that countries that have got this right. For instance, China. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have very good data on what was the quality of education in China 30, 40 years ago. But the evidence we do have suggests that it was quite a kind of disciplined, kind of extensive, intensive 
schooling system. And they're draw, drawing that dividend now because they there are now opportunities in the economy to expand. People have jobs, but it's because of the education that has built up over the over time. And that's the kind of buildup we've actually been seeing in South Africa. And again, I mean, you were surprised and a lot of people are surprised. Mm-hmm. It, and, you know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, it, 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 it's difficult for, for, for myself and, and somebody like Nick Spall will say the same thing. I don't agree with Nick Spall at all things, but I certainly would agree with, he would agree with me on this, that, the, that those international tests are important and that we are moving in the right direction. And we need to continue focusing on that and the recovery after the pandemic needs to be in terms of that. So when we say, are we going to get to Malaysia? These international tests put Malaysia at a particular point. We're still quite below that point. But if we continue along the pathway that we've done, been been on over the last 20 years, we can get to Malaysia 10 to 15 years from now. So that's what we need to focus on. Okay, okay, okay. Now, you speak about the... The oncoming speeches that are provincially based, you say they'll be happening in April, yes. What do you, we're in Gauteng right now, what do you feel in your expert space are the key issues which the the, the provincial government needs to take into account um, and really prioritize uh, where the Gauteng province is concerned? Well, each of, yeah, it, provinces are hugely important mm. in this whole process because they run the schooling system. Of, there's obviously a national curriculum and there's a lot of national guidance, but ultimately provinces take a lot of decisions. Mm. And what is, I, th- I think provinces have been doing certain things well and certain things not so well. Uh, I think that the the very, very strong emphasis on secondary schooling, on on the matric has kind of brought about some important improvements. There are now more young people, including quintiles one, two, three youths with a bachelor's level pass, which allows them to study for a bachelor's program at university. Remember, if you have that lower diploma pass, you can actually still go to university, Mm -hmm. but you can't do, technically you can't do a bachelor's uh, degree. But I think that where we need to kind of refocus even at the secondary level is on that top level of say mathematics and physical science because although we have more young people getting bachelor's level passes if you look at the results you'll see that um, the number of young people getting 50 percent in maths Mm -hmm. or 60 percent and these are thresholds that the engineering faculties for instance use at universities if you look at how many young people are getting that, it's not changed a lot. And this is in a context where we need more engineers. Every time we have load shedding, in a way we're reminded we have part of the problem is the skills. The, the, the economy needs skills. And that top end has not been expanding as it should. So at the, so I would say, you know, that's one thing the provinces need to, need to focus on. And sometimes the, the, the choices are difficult there. For example, in Gauteng, uh, the data suggest that Gauteng improved to some extent their their high-level mathematics outputs at schools by having fewer youths in the maths classroom. Okay. Yeah, because currently about half of, I think it's about half of our maths students fail. All right. Now, the question is, should they have been sitting in the maths class in the first place? You know, should they have not been sitting in maths literacy? Why waste space, in a way? And teacher capacity. And teacher capacity. Rather let teach. And I think Gauteng did something good by actually reducing the number of learners in taking maths, but at the same time focusing on getting those top learners achieving those 50%, 60%. And that's easier to achieve in a smaller class. Yeah. So then I'd say at the provincial level, yes, let's go on with this push to get as many young people as possible with bachelor's level uh, degrees, though there is an, uh, there's a problem, which you, you alluded to. A lot of young people think, okay, I'm ready for u- university, mm. and then there's not a space mm. at the university. Yeah. But let's also focus on that top, that top end. Then at the primary level, I think there's a lot. There's a lot that needs to be done to... Um, 
to strengthen our focus on those very, very basic skills. Uh, there are very interesting programs that have uh, been rolled out in other countries, for instance, Peru, which has seen remarkable improvements in the quality of their education, had a program about 20 years ago, it was started 20 years ago, where they began to distribute these materials to parents and asked parents, look, can please check whether your child can read this. And if you as a parent can't read, go to your local church or who, whatever, ask somebody else to do it for you. Check whether your child can read. And if your child can't read, go to your school and say there's a problem. But, and I think that's really important because the, the, pro, the problem in schooling is often that parents kind of trust that the schooling system will do what it is expected mm -hmm. to do. And it may not be doing what it, or particular schools may not be doing what they should be doing. And parents are just one other arm of that accountability structure. But then we need to arm parents with the right information, the right materials. Um, and I mean, I've had personal experiences of this, of people, parents asking me, "Can is my child actually supposed to not, should my child not be able to read this? Or what should my child be able to do in grade three? And if you go online and look for materials, there are not that many materials aimed at South African parents. And also, I mean, this this made itself known um, during COVID, where parents were doubling up as educators um, at home, doubling up as tutors. And we can empower households with 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 the content, uh, but the teaching and learning experience within within the household was a thing that was questionable in particular during COVID-19, parents being unprepared, which speaks to a greater, I would say, disconnect between the parent and learner and teacher dynamic uh, within, within, within our country as a whole. I want to also use Cape Town and the Free State as a kind of litmus when it comes to the budget. And I really appreciate, sir, uh, Martin, with you trying giving us a sense of the the economic value chain, if you will, of of, of our country's education budget. Ketan is always seen as the the the, the model uh, of how things should run in terms of, you know, budget spend and results and 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 in few years we've we've seen how Free State also came with their own strategies and uh special moment of condolence to MEC Tate Mahwe, who really played a huge role in sort of rethinking and reshaping um, 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 the, the, education, the education system then from the Free State. So using Cape Town and using the Free State, what did these two particular provinces do right uh, that other provinces can take note? Um. Yeah, I mean, if one needs to obviously keep in mind that that you know a province like Western Cape or even Gauteng has the advantage of having a bigger middle class, mm -hmm. and it's always easier to do schooling when your middle class is bigger. Mm -hmm. um, they have that natural advantage. At the same time, one has to acknowledge that they're very interesting and important things that both of those provinces have done. I think Western Cape. Uh, has managed for a couple of decades to maintain a unique system called the systemic tests, where they are monitoring the learning in basic kind of language and mathematics across all schools. Mm -hmm. Absolutely remarkable program that gives planners something to go up, to go by. It helps them to know where are the dead dead spots in the system mm -hmm. where children are not learning. Gauteng is doing something similar. Um, they, they're giving their district officials tools to go into schools, ask the principal, look, can, can we just talk to a few of these 10-year-olds and get them to read very basic stuff. But even that can help to pick up if, there's, if there are serious problems. Of course, they don't ask the school to select the, the, the children. They ask for the list of children and then they pick children at random out of that list so that the school doesn't present their, 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 their strongest learners. Free State has been a very interesting uh, case. Um, 
I must say that you know they 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 matric results are often referred to, and I'm I'm a bit skeptical, and, and I think I should be skeptical because uh, the matric results are quite easily manipulated. Okay. It all depends on the pass rate. Is of course the passes over who wrote the exam. Now, if you have fewer people writing the exam, course, it, you can manipulate yes, it. Yes, and yes. if you look at stats as household data, free state does not as, appear as spectacular as it does with respect to the pass rate. So that's why one must always be quite careful with these measures. However, there are a number of um, good things that I think free state has clearly been doing. Um one of them is, I mean, I remember in this one analysis picking up that Free State had been relatively good at ensuring that more historically black schools got uh, computer centers mm -hmm. and had students at the secondary level enroll in computer, graph uh, computer applications technology, mm -hmm. the computer subjects. There, I think we have been very weak as a country. Um, the uh, there was a report I did for the National Planning Commission uh, where we looked at um, the learners matrics who take these technology subjects including engineering graphics and design and so on in their matric it looks like it looks a little a little bit like apartheid I mean um, about 50% of white male learners are doing these technical subjects then it goes down white females indians <laughs> where you know by the time you get to black african females in matric it's down to i think it's about four percent are taking any of those technical subjects that that needs to change and uh i think that uh free state ma has has done relatively well in terms of ensuring that the equipment and the teachers that are needed to provide broader access to those subjects has occurred. I think they could have done more, but uh, but that has yeah that has to some extent improved. I mean, you say you know what what do we need to do better? I think that one of the things that we're very scared, reluctant to do, I think, in education for a number of reasons, is to talk about. Uh, educational achievement by race and gender um, for various reasons. I think anything from like it's embarrassing mm. to it's it's just sensitive. We don't want to talk about race. But the thing is, we have we have an employment equity system in the workplace which uses these criteria. Yeah. Now, surely as an education system, we should be focusing on how many black engineers or how many engineering ready matriculants are we producing who are black or female and so on yeah. and that i think is some that but that would require quite a mind shift there's there's a curious kind of discrepancy i think between the way the education system thinks about transformation and the way the labor legislation thinks about transformation the two need to be aligned to each other yeah yeah so looking at the eastern cape as our last province for this um I suppose this exam these examples that we are using this afternoon. Where does the province need to focus on? Because I mean, there's a lot of chatter. This is happening. That is happening. Uh, circum or circumstances or cases rather where you know thirty eight million rand is used uh, in, in in suspicious ways in one school. This that and the third and, and it almost feels like the bottom line is always maladministration slash corruption, uh, but on a very technical, uh, broader, holistic view. What is the Eastern Cape not doing? Or what are they doing that they just need to strengthen their muscle in in getting those numbers up? Yeah. Well, they actually have been getting their numbers up. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the, uh, the, the provinces that have boosted the number of NSC passes over the years. Eastern Cape has moved faster than any other provinces, province, but that's because it was way down to begin with mm. 15 years ago. So they have uh, moved that uh, and they need to continue to do that because it's still a province where it's 
particularly unlikely to get a matric, even with those improvements. They need to they need to work further mm. on this. And it's interesting to kind of look at how the Eastern Cape has done this. The Eastern about half of the Eastern Cape had a very strange kind of architecture in their schooling system. You would go from grade one to nine, and then you'd go to another school from grade ten. Yeah. And often that school was quite far away. It was, and that created a barrier. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have primary and secondary schools as most of the country, about ninety percent of the country has. They have been re, re, kind of engineering their school system so that they have more primary and secondary. So now it's Eastern Cape looks a more looks more like the rest of the country. And I think that has been good. That will facilitate movement up into uh, matric. Um, but, you know, I, I think Eastern Cape's challenges are in many respects similar to those in other provinces. It's about uh, strengthening the administration. And this is something I talk a lot about, is that I've written a lot about that... Um, you know, although administrators in a province of maybe just a hundred, you know, people, those hundred people are really, really important, and they need to have the training and the capacity to get things right, um, to count, you know, essential things like counting learners, ensuring that te the teachers are sent where the learners are. Uh, monitoring learner educator ratios, learner, monitoring class sizes. We don't monitor class sizes very well. And I think if we, the administration does that better, it'll be able to act better. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, monitoring basic fundamental skills in the at the primary level. Uh, are children reading? Which means moving beyond what's the predominant model currently is that in every school, uh, your teachers run their own internal uh, assessments. Um, those are important. Teachers do need to assess. They submit those marks. But the thing is, school A and school B might be applying very different standards. Mm -hmm. And what we do, what we, what is very clear from the evidence that we have is that very often what schools report is totally at odds with the reality. So schools may say, 80% of our children are ready to move from grade four to grade five, but then if there's an independent assessment, one finds that children are not, maybe, you know, 20% are actually technically ready for the next grade. They're pushing through children who, are, who just aren't ready. And we need, you know, we need to acknowledge that somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Martin, um, uh there is someone who's sitting at home listening to everything that you've said today and they have a yearning to be a teacher um, in South Africa, in the Jake's Harbour Fellowship, be a teacher's old mantra. What are your words of encouragement uh, to someone who's sitting there contemplating um, whether or not to pursue this, this, this line of work and this form of service to the country? Well, it obviously it this is this is an amazing way of taking communities in the country forward, and it's very rewarding. I mean, I, I myself have had this experience of seeing former students of mine from the secondary school where I worked um, you know, succeed, have these have these amazing accomplishments. And that's very, very rewarding. So, um, yeah, it, it's true what they say that 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 that, that it's it's a it's a mission in a way. Um, but let me not be too romantic. I mean, I'm, I have a I have a training as in in economics as well, and economists are never very romantic. Think of the practical things as well. Yeah. Um, school holidays. Yeah, you know, if you want to spend more time with your children at home. School holidays provides a space for that. It may not be the best paid occupation, but it's stable. You know, the the uh, industries come and go. Um, we saw what happened to the airlines during the during the pandemic. Education, schooling will always be there. If anything, there will be more of it. 
there'll always be a need for your work. Um, technology is never going to replace teachers. Um, so in that sense, it's it's actually quite a stable job. Yeah, yeah. With everything that you have uh, shared today, you know, balancing the facts from the quote unquote on your part, the doom and gloom um, that is usually shared with the country. Martin, are you hopeful about where we are going as a country where education is concerned? I I think I am. Yes. Um, you know, one 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 needs to be one needs to be realistic. One absolutely has to face up to to challenges, and I think the temptation is there sometimes to shy away from the challenges. We shouldn't do that. I think there there. I mean, I've outlined certain gaps. I think we have, and we need to focus on those. But I think that you know, in 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 we we have we've shown that we can actually improve i think the, the the 20 years 20 or so years of improvements that i was referring to that a lot of people don't, don't find difficult to believe that they, they have proven that we can actually improve and we need to get back onto that kind of improvement trajectory remembering that the higher up you go the ladder the more difficult it is to move even further up so what we got right 10 years ago, the, th the strategies we used 10 years ago, and we could have a whole separate conversation about what that was, those strategies may not work for the next 10 years. Yeah, for reimagination. We, 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 need to, we need to make sure that we have strategies that are appropriate for the context uh, and the realities and, and the budgets that we, that we face. Yeah. yeah. Martin, we really do appreciate your voice in the space, I, for one, feel um, enlightened in many senses, understanding how this money thing works uh, and how we are the way we are, provincially speaking, and the possibilities of how we can be nat uh, na nationally uh, as a country. So thank you so much for your voice in the space. Hopefully, we can have you in the room with more experts, interdisciplinary uh, conversation around the state of South Africa and ed the education system um, and where it can go. Uh, really, really excited for that kind of possibility. But from us, we thank you so much for your time. Matawa, well, thank you so much. It's been lovely. I, I thought I'd say, I was going to have to say, talk more about the actual budgets, but maybe some other time. That's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone who is listening and you want to know how do I get in touch with the Jake Scarvel Fellowship, you go to your favorite search engine, type in the Jake Scarvel Fellowship, you'll find a stunning website with all of the necessary details that you need to get in touch with us. And we will see you next time. It's been a blast. I am Matabut Lady. I'll see you on the other side of this. Bye. Thank you.